So if you've been watching my videos for a while, you know how much I love etymology. So I just wanted to talk about that in more detail, um, why I found it to be so absolutely key, when to use it, um, and yeah, it's, it's, I found that it's a really, really good tool. So it works a lot better if you've you're familiar with these things and you really have a big desire to let go of beliefs and connotations you have attached to words. So words are really beautiful and um, read Rumi's poems if you disagree with me. Language is for creation and so when we're creating with it, when we're sharing love, when we're sharing beauty, when we um, create something that has the power to evoke um, powerful feelings in somebody um, and to share that experience, that's the real proper, <laughs> there's not really a proper use of language, which is why um, poetry sort of like fades, it's, its meaning sort of fades away into this glorious mist of beauty. I'm sorry, I'm not that poetic, but you get the picture. So when you look up etymology, it has that sort of same fading effect. <laughs> is if you say the word fork over and over and over and over, it loses its meaning. Your mind's just like, what? That was ever a word? Are you serious? I believe that was actually a thing. That is so crazy that that combination of sounds and letters actually represents something. I think we've all had that experience. But with etymology, and some of the words are really pretty disappointing, you, <laughs> to be honest, when you look at the etymology of them. But some of them, if you have like any sort of um, non-dual background or intuition, um, you'll just like see these little bright spots uh, like shining through the word and you can see through some of the connotations. And this is incredibly powerful if you find that a word triggers something in you. Um, if you find yourself like journaling is an awesome way because then you're already using language, you're already like looking at the language, you have this heightened uh, awareness <laughs> of the language that you're using. But if somebody says something to you and you feel it as an insult, um, it's, a, it's a good time to like look up the etymology of it. And like I say, it doesn't always work, but a lot of times it does. So I've talked about craziness and the idea of being crazy and the judgment of being crazy quite a bit. Um, but recently somebody denounced an entire group of people as crazy. And I just like happened upon this situation while doing errands and it bothered me. Um, and the entire interaction, like, I could tell it was just, there was a ton of stuff there for me to see about myself. So when I went home and I journaled about it, the I just started seeing, like, light <laughs> show up everywhere. Um, and I really like the analogy of being in a maze or a labyrinth. And when you start to really want to feel better and want to apply this understanding. It's like you, uh, you feel yourself kind of like bonking against those walls and you, it's quicker and quicker that you can come out of the labyrinth. And so that's what etymology does is it like goes back to the source or the origin of the word. I see those like, <laughs> I see the light. <laughs> um, so when I looked up the etymology of the word crazy, it means like crazy. And I'm a glass artist, so of course I was like, oh, <laughs> it means like a pattern of something going every which way. And then as I was journaling, it just the song that I had been listening to and thinking about and reacted to came up about lightning 
and I made the connection of lightning being crazy, crazy, <laughs> like crazy in the sky, going every which way in that sort of pattern and direction, and how free it is. And so, connotations like that, like thinking that we can denounce somebody as crazy and know that somebody is crazy or denounce ourselves as crazy or fear that we're crazy, comes from the belief that we can secure ourselves in thought. Um, and so that sort of like poetry, that like liberation of language seems crazy, but really is the true free creative expression. So if you have an open mind, you look up etymology. Here's another great example. So somebody was saying that they hated to be called cute. So I looked up the etymology of the word cute and it comes from acute. Uh, and it can mean like really smart or accurate or like an acute angle. And you start like making so many connections that sort of like come back to creativity and like, um, the Masonic symbol, like the G God geometry and the compass and like creation <laughs> and a cute angle. And it's funny how like our emotions and our self-identification is all kind of, uh, it all kind of comes back together. It's, it's amazing how there really aren't separate subjects like art, geometry, philosophy, religion, spirituality, science. Um, and it's funny how sometimes in order to go forward, to let go of beliefs that aren't serving us anymore, sometimes like going back and seeing um, like where we picked those up or there's really no continuum to the story at all, which kind of gives us the resource and the freedom of using the past in order to heal the future. Um, and this sort of came to me in such a profound way uh, when, like right before <laughs> my life started getting super crazy, I read this book by a clairvoyant doctor and I just recognized so many things in that and like the, uh, our desire to heal and how strong it was at that time. It was, the book was written late 1800s and he'd always already been practicing for years and years at that time. And there were like toxic like mercury and lead being prescribed and ingested in food at that time like there was so very little we knew and there were so many absolutely hopeless cases that he would end up seeing and the desire was so so strong for healing that these kind of um non-traditional methods were sought as a last resort and yet seemed to be um, so productive as well. And like I see the same exact thing happening today that we put so much weight on science and we've come so far and so many of our desires have been fulfilled through uh, traditional medicine in that way and yet you have this clairvoyant doctor who s took a lot of his time to absolutely denounce tobacco. And it wasn't until a hundred years later that science actually agreed with it. Sometimes it's quicker to actually go back um, and see where the light is shining through something. <laughs> Um, and take that into the future. 
So another thought that I just wanted to share, and I don't even know if this is really um, goes together with this or not, but I was thinking about how a lot of spiritual teachings sort of get you to undo the like weight and the burden of life and thinking that you have to get it right and that um, it's something that you can lose, something that you have to work really hard to keep together and hold in place and protect. And uh, we try to undo that by telling people that it doesn't matter. It's just a game. And I thought of this book I read, and it was Ender's Game. And I'm going to spoil the entire story. But he trains throughout the entire book. And at the very end of it, he thinks that he's passing this final test. And in reality, he's actually fighting the very battle and so all of the weight of the world is on his shoulders and he has absolutely no idea whatsoever he just thinks he's passing his test it's not it's it's fake it's not really happening so in that way neither case is true and that's exactly (laughs) the best of both worlds the you can have your cake and eat it too that this is neither game, it matters, and yet it doesn't. There's no past or future, but this is all for the enjoying, for the taking right now. So I don't know if this has any spiritual education value other than it's hilarious, but I use the metaphor of having your cake and eating it too. And I wrote that out to somebody this morning and I wrote it out, I think in my journal in another place. And I've been using that metaphor a ton lately. So when I got home from filming this, my husband told me that the dog had eaten the rest of my birthday cake. (laughs) So I got home to the news that there was no more cake. And it just, like, the <laughs> the hilarious synchronicity of that. I'm enjoying way more than I would have enjoyed the rest of the birthday cake. Because I had a lot of it today. And on my birthday. So, um, that sort of brought me around to the other hilarious thing. So, what a pun is is it something that has two different meanings? And so it sort of dissolves into nonsense, as I was talking earlier about poetry dissolving and then repeating a word um, so long it doesn't have a meaning anymore, which hit me in a very similar thing as a mantra. But so the pun sort of dissolves the meaning and it dissolves into hilarity. So... One of the most horrible, like, horrific (laughs) puns is, like, it's so bad, it's punishment. (laughs) So somebody was talking about how it feels as if the, like, the burden of life or the burden of being born. I was looking up the etymology of burden today, and it went together with some of the challenges my friends and everyone are facing just so incredibly well. But burden comes back to carrying something, like being pregnant, giving birth to something. And so a lot of our problems happen when we are born. So it's neither that we're never born or we are born. It's that double meaning. The truth is is not in one interpretation or the other. And so (laughs) the birthday cake being eaten, being gone, the, the symbolism and the synchronicity and the hilarity in that, I'm just really enjoying. So this... I mean, normally you're supposed to be sad when your birthday cake gets eaten, but this is, I mean, this is enlightenment, guys. (laughs) 
thought it was going to look all big and spectacular. <laughs> it's really, it's a punishment. <laughs>